Atlanta is a city with a rich history. Founded in 1837, it has seen everything from protests for change to the 1996 Olympics, and is now a modern capital with a population that has grown 40% in the last decade. But as wonderful as this progress has been, it's important that we not forget our past or the people who called this city home long before we did. That is what the Buckhead Heritage Society continues to do, according to president and founding member, Tamara Basil. The Buckhead Heritage Society was founded in 2006 by Wright Mitchell. And Wright and I had worked together on a neighborhood project along with another man. And so the three of us became the founding officers of Buckhead Heritage. The mission is to identify, preserve, and protect the historic resources of Buckhead, which is a much larger geographical area than most people realize. Our first project was Harmony Grove Cemetery, where we are today, and it was um, started in 2006, the year we were founded, and it, it went over approximately four years of intense restoration, and it's still going on today. As their first project, Harmony Grove was the catalyst for the Buckhead Heritage Society's inception. The cemetery represents an important part of not only the community's history, but their society's history as well. And yet, they stumbled upon it entirely by accident. In a way, it was serendipity. Uh, many people in the community knew that the cemetery was here uh, because they could see the obelisk behind me from the street, even when it was completely overgrown but they thought it was considerably smaller than it is and they thought it was possibly a family cemetery uh, as opposed to a community cemetery. Uh, there were older people, of course, who knew that there had at one time been uh, a church on the property. Uh, they would not necessarily have seen that building, but they would have read about it in, in historic accounts. So when White saw the obelisk as he was jogging by one day, uh, he got the idea of exploring it and researching it. And one thing led to another led to another. So that's, um, and that's often how we get involved in projects. We'll get a call from a member of the community um, who is concerned about something that's happening to uh, either a building or a structure or a cemetery in the community. We've actually been involved in uh, three, uh, three other cemeteries. Um, we, we were very instrumental in uh, the legal battle to save Mount Olive Cemetery, which is on Far Road. It's an African-American cemetery. We also came up with uh, a comprehensive restoration plan to uh, restore the cemetery, a cemetery, Piney Woods, which is over off Lenox Road. And there are others as well. The society has been instrumental in the preservation and restoration of multiple cemeteries around Atlanta. And they go above and beyond on every project that they undertake, dedicating long, grueling months to beautifying these sacred spaces. It was a long and arduous process to restore this beautiful cemetery. We started with a survey, of course, of the property. We then uh, removed all of the uh, invasive growth, and I'm talking about up to four feet of bushes and, and poison ivy, ivy. Uh, we removed all the dead trees from the property, and much of that work was donated to us. Uh, next, we uh, removed the invasive uh, non-native species. Um, we hired a mortuary archaeologist to work with us to locate uh, where the burials, the unmarked burials, are located. During that process, they told us that we would have to remove all of the ivy that 
that at that point covered the cemetery. Uh, and we, we had a crews do that in August one year when it was over 100 degrees, but they removed all of the ivy. We were left with basically a denuded cemetery. And then they began their probing. At the same time that that work was going on, we, um, we did research, primarily Wright Mitchell, uh, researched the history of the property, the history of the two church congregations that had been on the property, even items about the lives of the people who are buried here. Uh, later, we, we've had three different um, efforts to restore the property. Uh, I'm sorry, to restore the monuments on the property. And that's an ongoing process. Uh, we, we wrapped up some restoration work last year and we'll be doing more every year as we are able to raise the funds. And we still, of course, maintain the property on a bi-weekly basis and we continue to plant appropriate plantings here like the recent non-native azalea uh, plants that were were installed. Richard Waterhouse, executive director of Buckhead Heritage Society, was also part of the beautification process. Sure. Um, I have been with Buckhead Heritage Society since December of 2008, 2017. We have a lot of uh, plants like azaleas in the cemetery and other areas of the cemetery and trees that have been here um, for the last few years. And one of the things that uh, Buckhead Heritage has done is to uh, restore and preserve the cemetery and one of the ways they've done that is through the plantings and also through the walkways as well. To see the cemetery restored feels wonderful. Uh, it's been a process. Uh, I failed to mention that we did have a comprehensive landscape plan done in 2009 which we have continued to tweak but we have had many professionals, landscape professionals, cemetery professionals, historic preservationists, many people have contributed to, uh, to this today, not just Buckhead Heritage. We've had a lot of community support and a lot of neighborhood support. The preservation is important because um, it is leaving a legacy for other uh, generations. Other folks can come see what we have done and it's also preserving and protecting the graves as well because before they were all covered up in vines and weeds and everything else. Now that the graves are uncovered, their true beauty and boundless symbolism can be appreciated. Their messages finally free from the neglect of time. When the cemetery um, started was, was at about the 1830s, was right at the beginning of the Victorian period. And the Victorians um, really loved symbolism. So in uh, cemeteries in the 19th century, you have a lot of symbolism. And some of the ones that you have is you have the rose, which is a symbol of love. Um, and sometimes the rose will be um, opening, and that's a symbol of the beginning. And then if it's closing or it's dying, it's a symbol of the ending. And then you also will see the obelisk, and the obelisk is um, pointing the soul towards heaven. Um, the Christian Victorians really believe that, um, that, that you, you would die, um, but there was a second coming. So if you go to Victorian cemeteries, you'll see a lot of things pointing upwards, um, showing you how to go, to go to heaven. And then some of the other symbols that you see in this particular cemetery, you have things related to sleeping, because the word cemetery remain, uh, means sleep, uh, means um, go to sleep or sleeping, so you have those as well. In the cemetery, there's a hand coming down, which would be the hand of God, and you have three chains, and the three chains would be the symbol of Trinity, and the idea is that the, uh, God, the hand is coming down to take, the, to take the soul to heaven, and what it is doing is breaking the bond here on earth. On, on one grave that's behind me, there's a um, obelisk and it has a mantle on top of it. Um, and the mantle is, um, is thought of as a cloth between um, heaven and earth. And if you're on, on one side of the mantle, it's a symbol of um, you're alive. If you're on the other side, it's a symbol of that you're dead. And you'll see tassels and the Victorians, um, one way that they would show their wealth was, was 
how large their tassels were on their curtains. So the larger the tassel was, the more, the, the more money they had. So you see that in many cemeteries as well. Without this knowledge, these images might seem unnecessary, mere decoration. But the symbols present on these gravestones are intricate and laden with meaning. They aren't for the dead, but for the living, conveying messages from generation to generation. And in doing so, they give us insight into not only the people buried there, but also the care and compassion of the families, friends, and community they left behind. I think the cemetery is a sacred place because of who you have buried here. Um, this is one of the founding areas of Atlanta. And I always think cemeteries are a, a sacred place because um, it, it's where they ended their lives. And in many cases, um, the people, you don't really have any, uh, any other thing other than the gravestone, so you have that, that knowledge of them as well. The first marked burial in Harmony Grove um, was done in 1870. And of course, the, um, the community really began in the 1840s. There were Native Americans here before that, and I'm sure after that. But, um, and we don't know much about the history between 1840 and 1870, although we do um, think that we have evidence on a map that there may have been a meeting house on this proper property, and that may be why they began to use it as a burial ground. Um, the, the community was very poor, um, and um, a lot of the, I'm sure a lot of the early uh, burials were unmarked, but the first marked burial was 1870, and that was the son of a man named James H. Smith. Smith was one of the largest landowners in the Buckhead community at the time, about 405 acres of land, and owned a house near what is now the intersection of Paces Ferry Road and Arden Road. It's strange to think he lived so long ago and yet so many Atlanta citizens commute through what might have been his front yard every day. He was buried in Harmony Grove only two years after his son, joining several other notable figures in Atlanta's history. There are some well-known uh, relatives of well-known people buried in the cemetery. Uh, Julia Roberts' great-grandparents are buried here. And I'll also comment that her, uh, her local relatives continue to do a wonderful job of, of honoring their, and their forebears by uh, bringing flowers uh, at appropriate times during the year. Uh, we also have Confederate uh, veterans buried here, and um, we also have um, just some interesting stories of people. We have um, the father of one of Atlanta's mayors is buried here. Um, but I would say the majority of the folk here were, were community, uh, just members of the community. Now, James H. Smith, whose son was the first burial in 1870, James uh, himself died and was buried here in 1872. He donated, he was a relatively wealthy man for that, for the community, and we know that through his, uh, through his will. Uh, but he is the man who donated the property for what is now New Hope um, AME Church on uh, Arden Road. And they have a, a cemetery across the street uh, that's part of that church. And um, with, uh, it's actually bigger than this one. And they've been working on the restoration of that cemetery. He donated that property for a school and a church, and that is still an active congregation, primarily uh, of descendants of the original uh, attendees, members there. The, the dates of burial here for the marked uh, burials date from 1870 to 1982. The last burial was of Charlotte Krauss, whose mother, father, and brother had previously been buried here and she died at 90 and was buried here in January of 1872. The bodies and, um, dare I say, souls of um, under 200 people are buried in this space. Um, 
and I think we honor those lives uh, and the, the sacred um, aspect of those lives when we preserve cemeteries. Um, they also are an important part of preserving the stories of the community, which I think is very important. There's a wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin that tells why he thought it was important to honor our dead, and I wish I could repeat it for you, but I think that how we treat our dead um, reflects the people who we are. And it, um, it pains me to see cemeteries that are either abused or neglected. This is important work that the Buckhead Heritage Society is doing. They're a tight-knit group of people, bonded by an important cause, preserving the past. Working with the Buckhead Heritage Society has been great. It's really like working with a, a large family because everybody there is um, very committed to the history and the preservation of Buckhead. And um, we have um, many, many people on the board and as volunteers that know the history of Buckhead and we can share that history with our members and other folks that go to our website. They have so many plans for the future of Harmony Grove Cemetery. My hope for the cemetery at this point would be that we could continue the monument restoration and stabilization of the uh, stones that are used to mark the unmarked graves. Also, the, the restoration of some of the lower walls uh, would be helpful. Uh, we have um, the need to, uh, to add more ivy along the front wall but it doesn't seem to want to, com to, to cooperate with us. We've tried to, uh, to get it to grow before. Their plans don't stop there. They also extend to other areas within their community. Buckhead Heritage has several projects underway right now. We are uh, attempting to do, to add to a survey of historical uh, buildings and structures in places in Buckhead. And we have the, um, an excellent foundation for that, but it needs to be updated, and we plan for that to become the cornerstone of our preservation work going forward. We continue to uh, love to educate uh, the community uh, by giving tours and monthly lectures of historic um, places in Buckhead. With all of these projects and activities in store, they're always looking for extra hands. Um, you can do anything from helping us out in the cemetery, or you can, um, or you can help us out with special events. Um, for example, we just finished the scavenger hunt, and we used a lot of volunteers for that. And we're looking for volunteers that are interested in helping us with the archives um, as well. So if you have a particular interest and you'd like to volunteer, we would love to have you. If you're interested in becoming a member of Buckhead Heritage Society, you can go to our website at www.bucketsociety.com. Um, and we also have programs throughout the year and you can find out about those programs on our website as well. A call to action. And just maybe, an opportunity to make the kind of difference Tamara and Richard have made through their work on Harmony Grove. This cemetery is loved by me and by many others because it is a peaceful, serene place right in the center of Buckhead. Even though, even though there's traffic uh, rushing by, uh, you, you really are not aware of it because there is so much growth in the woods of woods between us and West Paces Ferry. And even now you can hear the birds cheep chirping, uh, birds flying through. It's just a very tranquil and peaceful, sacred place. I think this is a place where many people in the community feel a sense of peace. We have fathers who bring their children and their dogs up here on Sunday afternoon. Um, and a, a lot of people who just come and sit. Having spaces like these that give a sense of peace, that are lush with beautiful plant life, 
are crucial, not just for relaxation, but for our physical and mental health as well. Blair Eli, a college student at Emory University, knows the power of her own local green space, Lowell Water Park, in soothing the anxieties of university life. Um, I started to realize at a certain point, I, was, I think it was around sophomore year of college, that there were not a lot of outlets for people to express their, their spirituality in any way or to even really see themselves as spiritual beings. Because we're, we're in a college environment where we're taught to think in terms of memorizing and turning out information and not really to contemplate things, um, I think it's really difficult for people to have the sort of perspective they need to just re really get through the day and think about what their beliefs are and any kind of foundational motivating meaning and purpose in life. Um, because a lot of it's just about, you know, getting an A on the next test or um, pulling off an event or whatever it is that is a part of your undergraduate career. Um, and because our school is more um, focused now on being pre-professional, um, that's been positive in a lot of ways, but it's been negative, I think, for a lot of students' mental health. And so I started to have a lot of friends um, and peers and just people around me who I realized were really, really struggling in terms of their mental health. Paying attention to one's well-being while still fulfilling the expectations of university life is a balancing act that is difficult to maintain. The mental health of college students is a growing concern among college counselors. The statistics show why. A survey of college students found that 57% of women and 40% of men report experiencing episodes of overwhelming anxiety, while 33% of women and 27% of men report periods of depression severe enough to disrupt their ability to function. The problem doesn't stop at undergrad either. It applies to grad school too. In a study at UC Berkeley, 45% of graduate students reported experiencing an emotional or stress-related problem that significantly impacted their well-being and academic performance. I thought that a lot of that um, was due to the fact that a lot of people aren't really given an avenue to express their spirituality and to be in a space like that because most people don't identify with a particular religious tradition. Even if they were raised in one, it's a time of sort of discovering what you believe and what you think and it's not necessarily comfortable to re-enter spaces um, that you maybe grew up in because you're trying to challenge some of those belief systems and people just aren't really at a stage in their life where they're ready to just fully assimilate themselves into one tradition or another. There's a lot of exploration involved which can be a very good but very difficult thing to have happen particularly when you can't prioritize it because you're trying to just get through college and you know, have a good time and also get through your classes. And so um, what I realized is that simply being outside plays a massive role in people just getting to feel their spirituality, to feel a part of something bigger, to acknowledge the natural world around them and to not just be in a library space, you know, shuffled from cafeteria to dorm room. Um, and so a big initiative that I wanted to work on was getting more people to take advantage of this beautiful space we have that's right here on campus um, called Wellwater and simply build community there and be able to have conversations about spirituality, mental health, religion, all those things. That's how the idea for Blair's program was born. It was, it was very simple. It was just what we called the program Outside In, which is like outsiding as a verb, like going outside. and outside apostrophe in, like you're going on the outside to get this sort of focus on your inner self. Um, and really we just created, you know, Facebook events and asked people to come out and got an amazing turnout week after week and people just came and enjoyed the park and got to talk and got to get really close with their environment and the people around them and it, it turned out to be a really positive, fun experience. I would say that it's all about realizing your smallness. I, I think for me, that, that's a big part of it, and I know that those words don't necessarily resonate with everybody, but, but being outside helps give perspective on where you are in your life. And so when you are struggling with, not, I'm not talking about some of the more severe mental health issues where you know people would really benefit from therapy and other types of um, 
help, whether it's medications or whatever it is, but really for everyone, both people struggling with those and who are just have simple everyday stressors and anxieties can benefit from being outside because of the perspective that, that it gives you on sort of getting outside of yourself um, and, and realizing that, again, you are a part of something bigger than you, that there's beauty in the world around you, being able to appreciate that, um, being able to appreciate this sort of design of the world around you that has a function and beauty and is built with tons of living beings and it's just it's wonderful and it, it makes people at ease um, and just without even actually having to conceptualize all of that it just really I think brings this sort of inner calmness and tranquility to just be in a space that is outdoors and, and natural. You too can find your own sanctuary in nature. So why should you go outside? It improves cognition. Nature helps us recover mentally and helps our brain function as it should. It alleviates stress. Nature acts as a balm on our frayed nerves, soothing anxiety just by existing. And it helps reduce the symptoms of mental and physical illnesses. Because of its effect on our bodies and minds, nature can also help with asthma, Alzheimer's, PTSD, strokes, obesity, and many more. And that applies to children too. So go for a walk today through your own local green space and take some time to smell the roses.